Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve sallallahu ta'ala ala seyyidil mursalin. Ve alihi ve sahbihi ve barik ve sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we continue in our look at Islamic revival. And this issue of Islamic revival is one of the crucial issues uh, for Muslims today. In that we have been blessed with... Uh, strategic countries throughout the world. We have been blessed with a young population, a growing nation, uh, tremendous wealth, even though the media may in many cases say the opposite, um, we are actually blessed with uh, tremendous wealth. Uh, recently, <clears throat> the elections happened in Turkey, and most of the media was talking about um, what a great uh, uh, problem and a difficulty it was um, for President Erdogan uh, and his party and that the Turkish economy is faltering. And you would think that it's a very weak state now about to fall and you know, about to be destroyed. Um, but what actually happened on the ground is that um, he and his party, although they overwhelmingly won close to 51% of the votes. The closest party to them is about 35%. Uh, <clears throat> but although some of the opposite ideologies, like a communist has been put into power in Istanbul, um, they allowed that. And he actually said, this is part of our democracy. This is real democracy, because we're allowing a difference of opinions uh, within our country. So when you read it from the Turkish media point of view, it's totally opposite from the other point of view. They recently opened up uh, unofficially uh, the largest masjid that was ever built by any of the Ottomans in the last 600 years. It's been built on the Bosphorus. It overlooks the Bosphorus uh, and uh, Istanbul itself. And uh, it is a huge masjid. It's like a museum. It has all types of um, features in it. And it is a great pride uh, of their nation. They are actually producing their own automobiles, uh, their own uh, helicopter gunships, um, all types of industry is in the country. So it is not a faltering uh, economy. They have been attacked. They have been put under sanctions. But they're a very uh, powerful e economy. And it is showing that Islam can function along with other ideologies uh, and other ways of life. So, what I'm trying to say is that what appears in the media, in many cases, is not necessarily the same on the ground. And um, that is the way it is with the Muslim world. And although we are facing um, tremendous pressure uh, and suffering in many parts of the world, uh, there is also still a rise in the amount of people who are identifying as Muslims and also in um, the practice of Islam. Uh, in different parts of the Muslim world. And so this is where revival is necessary because we have uh, a beautiful structure that is there. It has all the elements of a beautiful home. It has the kitchen, the bedrooms, it has everything. But um, <clears throat> there's no power inside of the, the building. The generator failed. The city's power is not going to that house. So therefore, it needs... Uh, energy. And that energy comes through revival. So the revival doesn't destroy your house and build another house. What it does is it, it allows the framework of your house, but it revives the energy. And maybe sometimes there's a new system of, um, of energy which is put into the house. Uh, but the structure remains, the light, the, the heat, the air conditioning, uh, the power uh, to make that house viable is the revival. And so this is with the House of Islam uh, where we are standing at this very critical time in the 21st century. And within the revival we understand that it is not a movement up, down. It is not somebody taking over power and saying this is an Islamic state. It is not any particular individual or group imposing themselves on a nation, 
but it is first um, a type of group consciousness that is developed uh, amongst the people. And from that group consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then leadership uh, starts to develop or it's recognized. Uh, and then the body uh, is able to function uh, in a proper way. And so the revival starts from within, within the individual, through the, 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 the intention and through the heart, uh, within the families, within the communities, uh, and ultimately the nation uh, and the ummah. Internal change. This is crucial, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us very clearly that he will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. So once that internal change is made, once that light is lit on the inside, then um, light spreads throughout the body. Now, one of the manifestations that comes after the intentions and the heart is the character starts to change, and then this starts to uh, relate to your outward dealings. And I'm using that in the general sense with the word mu'amalat. And mu'amalat is your interpersonal relationships, how you are dealing with people. It's something to do with your body language, your concept of yourself. Um, you know, it, it, it sort of a, sets the tone uh, for your dealings with other people. And so there are certain elements and qualities that are necessary within uh, the Islamic uh, uh, revival. And for amongst these qualities, and again, um, this 40 hadith is really developed after seeing Muslims <coughs> in different parts of the world, what they are going through, right? And uh, uh, bringing something from a prophetic point of view uh, that actually deals with it. <coughs> this issue that comes in hadith number 24. It is one of the crucial issues on all different levels of Islamic existence. <coughs> this hadith reported by Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu has said, uh, he told us, ittaqu dhulm fa inna dhulma dhulumatin yawm al-qiyamah. Ittaqu shuh fa inna shuha ahlaka man kana qablakum hamalahum an safaku dima'ahum wa stahallu maharimuhum. Ruwahu Muslim. <clears throat> so in this hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling us, beware of oppression. It taku dhulm. For verily, oppression will be a source of darkness on the day of judgment. Beware of greed. Beware of greed, for it destroyed those who came before you. It caused them to shed their own blood and make permissible the sexual abuse and rape of their own women. This is a deep hadith. And <clears throat> for those who um, innocently embraced Islam, for those young people coming up in Muslim families, for those who have revived their faith and read the sources, um, it is a shock many times to see Muslims fighting Muslims. And also to see sometimes the extent that they will go to uh, in dealing with each other. And this is a reality of human life. That although the person um, claims to be a Muslim, they're still human. And human beings have weaknesses. We have desires. We have ego. Um, we have different qualities that, as the Qur'an says, um, we are created in the best mold, right? Then we are taken down to asfala safili. So we can be in the highest mode, actually above the angels. We can actually be better than angels. Or we can lower ourselves that we are asfala safilin, which is even lower than animals that some of the things that people do to each other, the birds and the other creatures who are around watching human beings, they probably shake their head 
And they said, how can they be doing this, like to each other? Okay, they're the same breed. Even though the color might be different, there's different color dogs, right? There's different color ants, there's different color birds, but how can they act like this? The Prophet, peace be upon him, is giving us an analysis. And part of this analysis is dhulm. And dhulm, um, from dhalama, uh, it appears in many different forms in the Qur'an. This is one of those verbs that if you know this verb, you will see many different forms that it comes in. The uh, ismu fa'il, the doer of the action, is dhalim. Dhalim. The plural dhalimin. Like the, the dua, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka, inni kuntu min al-dhalimin. Okay? That Yunus alayhi salam, when he was in the belly of the whale, he said, uh, there is no God but you, O Allah. Um, glory be to you. I oppressed myself. Kuntu min al I was from the oppressors. Okay? The ism al-maf'ul, which is the action done on it, is madhlum. Madhlum. So you have dhalim and madhlum. Okay? So the dhalim is the one that does the action, and the madhlum is with done on them. They are the oppressed, that we would say. They would be the oppressed. Okay? Um, and that also comes uh, in different forms um, that you will find. And um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, even said, Ittaku dawatil madlum. Falaysa bainaha wa bain Allahi hijab. He said, Beware of the prayer of the oppressed. Dawatul madlum. Right? Because there is no hijab in between that uh, uh, dua and Allah. There's no barrier, which means it'll go directly to Allah. So he's saying it, taku da'watul madlum. Do not put yourself in a position where you oppress somebody and they make dua against you. Don't put yourself in that situation. Because when they make dua, there's no barrier between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a serious thing when you look at some of the aggression going on in the Muslim world that Muslims do to each other. And then you will see ultimately what ends up happening. And sometimes even in front of our own eyes to the people who did it uh, to that group and then it was done to them. Right? It came back. This dua that was made against them uh, was answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here... Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, again, is saying it taqudun. So he's saying, beware, be conscious, and very wary of oppression. For verily, oppression will be a source of darkness on the Day of Judgment. Dhulumat. Dhulumat. So you see the word dhalama? Dhulumat is darkness. Dhalam. Dhalam is darkness. You might say zalam in Urdu or zulm, right? It's pronounced in some other languages, Turkish too. They might say zulm, right? But it's really the, right? So zalam or dhulumat is darkness. And it's a plural too. So that means it's going to be layers of darkness. So oppression is going to cause layers of darkness on the day of resurrection. Okay? And... Um, Dhulm itself uh, can happen in many different ways. Of the major ways of dhulm is when you oppress another person. Okay? But you can also oppress yourself. Self-oppression. And this is a very serious thing uh, when the person oppresses themselves. Uh, it comes out in different forms of self-hatred. Sometimes people even abuse their own bodies. Uh, they abuse their families because they hate themselves. Uh, they do different things to their, um, their face and their hair. Uh, some of them want to be light-skinned because they think the skin is too dark, so they put on um, uh, chemicals to get light skin. 
bleach. Some people want to be dark skinned. So they put on chemicals and they lay down in the sun because they want to be brown. Right? Some people want curly hair. So they put little curlers in their hair and they make it curly. Some people want straight hair. So they put straightening creams in their hair to straighten it. And they do many things to their bodies. Sometimes they extend their lips. Sometimes now what people are doing is they're putting these, uh, these, these uh, rings and whatnot. In, sometimes they put a ring or a stud in their tongue. I can't understand that one. What's the beauty of having a stud in your tongue? Right? Because tongue is made, to, you know, you're drinking and eating, and this metal is in your tongue. And how many times do you wag your tongue in front of other people? But somehow they put it in the tongue. They put it in the eyebrows. They put it all over the place, in strange places, uh, in order to be beautiful. The Japanese women used to um, tie up their ankles, right? And they, they like little, um, their feet became really small because this was something loved by, you know, the Oriental man was, you know, a woman to have small feet. He didn't want a woman to have big feet, right? He wanted the small feet. So they would tie it up, uh, these geisha girls and whatnot. And you, you actually force your foot to be small so it cannot grow, okay? And so there's all types of things that people are doing uh, in order to get beauty. Um, and um, this, again, tattoos, of course, it's a disease. And recently with the uh, crisis in New Zealand, I was again shocked to see um, some of the bikers, some of the peoples in New Zealand that came to support the Muslims. They were from these, these groups. They have tattoos all over their face to literally their whole body is a tattoo. Okay? So this is oppression of self. It's oppression of self. And we can't blame anybody but ourselves when something like this happens. So dhulm is a terrible thing. And <clears throat> again, one of the um, overriding qualities of successful leadership is adal or adala, justice. If justice is uh, uh, instituted, then the leadership, the government, remains. People tolerate it and people want it. But if justice is taken away, and dhulm, of course, is like the opposite, when people are oppressed on all different levels, then it's just a matter of time before that regime uh, falls down. So dhulm is a very important subject. Um, you will see different forms of oppression, and I say it over and over again, you know, when people look at the Muslim world or even look at themselves, right? Unless oppression stops, you cannot help, you cannot expect the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot expect it as long as uh, we are involved in oppression. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, went on, and again, this uh, is very important quality also that we have to be aware of, where he said, beware of shuh, and this is uh, greed, right? These, these overwhelming desires, and this is greed. So when, when this uh, uh, shuh comes in, you know, the person becomes so greedy that they forget about everything. And, you know, again, over and over again, when you read about these billionaires, and you ask us y yourself, because we, most of us live on a very meager, uh, you know, salary. You know, 10,000, 20,000, if you get 50,000, 100,000 is, is a lot of money. What can you do with a billion dollars a year? What can you buy? Like, what can you do with that amount of money? There's not even, there's no food you can eat. There's no clothes you can buy. Like, what can you actually do with that money uh, if this is your money and greed? But some people will get that to millions and billions, and they still want more. And they will do strange things. And the other people on the lower level will do strange things in order to reach the billions. So this is shuh. Right? What happened to it? The Prophet ﷺ said, it destroyed those who came before you. And we clearly see the Qur'an speaking about the nations, the fallen nations, the Ad, the Thamud, 
Madain Saleh, we see in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you'll see the Fir'aun. You will see the Nimrod, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Iraq, in that area. You will see societies that reached high levels, uh, but when the greed kicked in, when they, you know, lost control materially, it destroyed them. Okay? Then, and this is very interesting, the Prophet says it caused them to shed their own blood. Now that's the question we're asking. Why would a Muslim, so-called Muslim, fight another Muslim? Okay? It will cause them to shed their own blood and even make permissible the sexual abuse and rape of their own women. And that is the lowest that you can possibly go. Okay? But it, has, it is happening. And we're witnessing it today. And um, so this uh, issue here, these issues are extremely important. And for the revival to happen, Muslims have to be wary of oppression and, uh, and greed and how it influences our lives. I want to open up the floor for any uh, questions that anybody may have uh, concerning dhulm uh, and, and shuh. Right? These are two um, uh, really important issues uh, that face Muslims in the Muslim world. Next, as we go on, and this is another um, case of leadership, uh, <clears throat> That the Prophet ﷺ, Maqil ibn Yasar narrated that the Prophet ﷺ has told us, Ma'man abdan yastar'ihi lahu ra'iyatan, yamutu yawma yamutu wa huwa ghashun li ra'iyatihi illa harram Allahu alayhi al-jannah. Ruahu Muslim. So any slave of Allah who was put by Allah in charge of the affairs of the Muslims. Okay, so this person's made a leader now and dies being dishonest to his subjects, will be forbidden by Allah from entering paradise. Now this is something serious, because you see in many societies, and, it has reached, and, and even within our own society, people want to be leader, and they will do anything. And you'll see people at all different levels want to be leader, um, and sometimes in the strange, strangest situations. I mean, I can recall being in Islamic uh, uh, communities, and you know, it's it's a masjid, you know, with people, a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand attend an Eid day or you know whatever, and then they call elections, um, and basically the people inside of this masjid who are going to be the leaders, they have to take care of the mosque, but they struggle against each other and say, brother, uh, can you uh, can you vote for me? Uh, they're actually campaigning. And then on election day, I've seen groups bring in 25 or 30 of their ex extended family and friends. They invite them all to the masjid, whatever, and make them vote. So they will get votes, so they become vice president or president of the Islamic Center. Now, you're president of the Islamic Center. What are you? Are you, are you an emperor? Are you Shah? Are you the great Khan of this area of town? What are you, man? It's only an Islamic center, but somehow in their mind, they feel like this is, I'll put it on my resume, or they just like the feeling that people say, that's the president. See, this is a sickness. Because in our traditions, you know, we learn from the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyid al-Qawm khadimuhum, that the Sayyid, the leader of a people, is the servant of the people. So it's the servant, the leader, true leader, serves the people. So when the person takes the position of uh, uh, the leader, they are actually supposed to be up while people are sleeping. They're supposed to be concerned about the affairs of the masjid or the community or the nation while everybody else takes care of themselves. So taking on a position of leadership is mas'uliya, it's responsibility. It's a very serious thing. And, and, and it's something, even in marriage itself, if a man you know, gets married and he now is given uh, uh, the position of Amir of his family, it means he's responsible for the protection and safety, the maintenance and protection of his family. So that's a serious thing. Okay? And, 
um, here the Prophet ﷺ is saying that if somebody finds themselves in this position, they're put in a position, right, taking care of the affairs of Muslims, and they're dishonest. Jannah is forbidden. Now this is a big thing. If you say Jannah is forbidden, that person might be making salat and fasting, and they might go to Hajj 20 times. They might do a lot of things. But that position of leadership is so important that it could actually land that person in Jahannam, in hellfire. So if Jannah is forbidden to that person, then that means he is or she is in trouble, serious trouble. And that's the reason why you find that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and throughout history, you'll find that many um, illustrious uh, you know, Muslims who had great leadership qualities did not want to be leader. They actually avoid leadership. And if you're ever in a situation where you, where you have to decide between one or two people or a couple, you'd be better off to choose the one who doesn't want to be leader. The one who comes forward and said, I'm the best, I want this. That's the person you shouldn't take. Right? Because desire is pushing them, you see? It's greed, it's desire like. They want the power. Okay? But the one who has fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, the one who has awareness of how serious that position is, that's the one you want to be the leader. Because a leader of Muslims is supposed to be somebody who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so um, you know, this favoritism and this you know, uh, oppression that comes on a leadership level, this is another uh, very important issue. So, so this now is something um, for the leadership. These hadiths are dealing with different levels uh, in terms of the revival. The issue of leadership is an extremely important uh, part of the Islamic revival because one of the things that I've found uh, from traveling to different countries and communities is in many cases um, they don't have a leader. They're looking for a leader. And it's not just somebody who can stand up there, but somebody who's really a responsible person, you know, who's sincerely taking care of the people in the group. Okay, so this, uh, this hadith is very important. Uh, it's a small hadith, but the meaning is a very powerful hadith. I want to open up the floor if there's any questions uh, anybody may have uh, concerning this uh, tradition itself. So this is dealing with uh, leadership. So these traditions coming out, remember this is mu'amalat. This is like interpersonal relationships now. Okay? And this here, this quality also, is crucial quality. This one here is one of the biggest issues uh, facing uh, Muslim leadership today. It's this one here. And over and over again, I've seen um, the importance of understanding the words of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And in it, um, it's a long hadith, uh, but basically the, the, be the beginning of the hadith is describing it. And it says, while the Prophet ﷺ was in a session speaking to the people, a Bedouin Arab came and said. This is A'rabi. So the A'rabi, the Bedouins, they didn't have etiquettes like a people of the city and whatever. They're very rough like. So they talk to you straight and sometimes put their hand on you and, you know, like that. They're not, you know, nicely, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, made like some of the people in the city. So this A'rabi came and he said, Meta sa'a. When is the day of judgment? So the Prophet ﷺ, look at the situation. He's dealing with a group of people. He's teaching. And this, this one comes in and just shouts out his thing. Okay? When is the hour? So he's obviously changing the topic, right? So the Messenger of Allah ﷺ continued to speak. So he just like continued, right? He didn't even take, take it on what this person was saying until some of the people said, he must have heard what was said and disliked it, meaning the Prophet. When the Prophet finished his discussion, he said, 
where is the questioner? Where, he said, where is the questioner? So then the Bedouin said, I am here, O messenger of Allah. So now the Prophet ﷺ is going to deal with him now. And remember, when he answers questions to an individual, he's really given a lesson to everybody and us to the day of judgment. That's his position, right? So his answer, um, you know, he says, فَإِذَا دُعِيَةَ الْأَمَانَةَ فَانْتَذَرَ السَّاعَةَ So he said, if amana or trust is lost, then wait for the hour. Following this, then the man said, and so, you know, the Prophet allows him to, you know, to ask him, okay, how will it be lost? Okay, and then the Prophet said, told him, إِذَا وُسِدَ الْأَمْرُ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ أَهْلِهِ فَانْتَذَرَ السَّاعَةَ if authority is given to people who are not qualified for it, then wait for the hour. Okay, so this now is a serious thing. And, and when hadiths come like this, where the Prophet is speaking about the hour, it is done for two reasons, one or more than two. But of the reasons, one is to inform us if we're close to the hour. But secondly, is to try to teach us what not to do. You see? What not to do. These are the qualities of the people at the end of time. Don't be like this. Right? It's a serious situation. It's going to cause the destruction of everything. Because the hour means everything's going to be destroyed. So this is one of the worst possible things that we can get into. And that is when amana is lost. What is amana? Very important. There's a lot of different descriptions that could come in English. Arabic is a very broad-based language. And when you use the word amana in different um, uh, situations, it, it, it can slightly change. We might have another, you know, we have different words. So it means, obviously, trustworthiness, because trust is there. So amana is trustworthiness. Loyalty. See, loyalty, very important quality. Honesty. Integrity. Confidence. Right? These are all, these are some of the descriptions. <clears throat> so a person who has a manna um, is not just a person who is trustworthy. Like you say, okay, I trust this person, you know, to close the door at a certain time or to, you know, it's also integrity. It's like an honest, like sidq. It's like a type of truthfulness and honesty inside of that person. Right? And also they are a loyal person. So, so they're, they're loyal to you. So whatever, they are, whatever they're given a responsibility, they have such loyalty, they will fulfill it. And it's interesting because um, <clears throat> the description of the Prophet Wasallam before the prophethood, the main uh, quality that they knew him as was Al Amin. That's what he was known as, Al Amin. There it is again, that's from Amana, right? So he was known as Al Amin. And so, because of this quality of truthfulness, trustworthiness, integrity, honesty, you know, it was such, to such an extent that when the tribes were rebuilding the Kaaba itself, and the black stone had to be put into place, because this happened before the prophethood, and they were ready to fight each other to have this uh, honor to put the stone in, then they said, who can we trust to, to help us in this situation? And they said, look at the next man coming in. The Prophet ﷺ came in, they said, he. He is Al-Amin. Right? And then, of course, he, he took uh, you know, some uh, cloth, some material. They put the black, the black stone in it, and each one grabbed a section of it, so they all put it in. So they were all involved. The key thing is, he had the honesty and he was trustworthy, integrity, confidence. They were confident in him, right? You see all these things? These are the qualities of leadership. This is a crucial quality. And this is more important when you're choosing a leader for the community 
than one who speaks Arabic nicely or even reads the Qur'an with tajweed, that person is going to lead your salat. But that's not necessarily the one who's going to be your leader, your amir. Right? You have to have a manna. This is a key uh, uh, thing to look for. And again, this, this word is so important that even you know, when, we say, when, we, uh, when a dua is said, when the fatiha is read, then we say, Amin. That's from the same verb. Amin. So we're certifying this. We're confident in this. We believe in, in, in the trustworthiness of this recitation. So we say, Amin. Right? That's the same word. That's how important this word is, right? This is an extremely important quality. And when people are looking for leaders or trying to understand why things are going wrong, look at this hadith. Interesting little part of the hadith where he said, if when authority is given to people who are not qualified for it. And we witness this even on a lower level. I'm not even talking about heads of state or, in, you know, that's clear. We even noticed here, and I don't blame anybody, <clears throat> that when our communities were being formed, um, the people who actually um, had the money and the taqwa to actually buy the building or put their name down on the thing, you know, they became um, uh, the, the, the trustees you know, of the buildings. And then in some cases, when they were looking for um, leadership, at that stage, especially in the 60s, uh, going into the early 70s, the people who usually came forward um, because the most qualified people we had Islamically were generally religious people who were probably engineers and doctors, accountants, but they're religious people. And mashallah, they came forward and they you know, fit into the positions and they did the best that they could do. But when it reaches a point now when you have a community that is going through uh, a, a evolution and where um, you know, there are certain issues that come up that require knowledge. They are not knowledgeable. Uh, they did not study in Islamic institutions. And you know, Islamic studies, like any other studies, is just like an engineer, if you know, or, or, or is a brain surgeon. Because you're good at you know, cutting meat, right? taking fat off meat, right? then you say, well, I'm good with a knife. So you're going to go inside and do brain surgery? No. You have to have years of study before you pick up that scalpel to touch somebody's brain. Okay? Similarly, there are certain issues in terms of um, fatwas being given, you know, religious decisions being given, guidance being given, which required people who are qualified for this. And when a person is not qualified and they put into that position, then it's trouble. And it even happened with people, and this is sort of the opposite now. We had communities where somebody came into the community who was knowledgeable, they went to an Islamic university, right, which meant that they, they're good, they could read Quran, they have Islamic studies, whatever. And they said, I'm the leader of this, this community. Everything comes to me. So he saw himself as the treasurer, the secretary, everything because he thinks he's the shepherd of the group. But he's not qualified to deal with the books, right? And so when the finance of that community, which is now developing, and thousands of dollars are being collected, and bills are being paid, he's not qualified to be the treasurer. But he thinks because he reads with tajweed, he can be the treasurer. You see, that's the same thing. He is not qualified to be the treasurer. And in many communities, when that happened, they fell apart, even though their leader appeared to be a person who you know, could talk about Islam and they had Islamic studies, they were not qualified for other positions of leadership. You see? So everybody has skills. And, and, and this is where um, operational unity, this is where recognizing the skills of other people, and we're all on a, on a football team, if you're on a football team, there's different positions on the football team, right? The person who's playing the goal in soccer, 
he doesn't go take the, the ball and run down the other end and try to kick it in. That's not his position, right? He's going to trip and fall. But when they try to get in the goal, he's qualified for this, right? So everybody has their position, and as long as people are in their positions, and they're honest, and they have integrity, enough integrity to say, I am not qualified for this position. That's a really, uh, you know, person who has, very honest person. And, and it's something that we need, where people will actually um, step down in leadership. Or they may be the leader in a certain position. Somebody else comes who's more qualified, and they say, you lead. There was one leader, um, Sheikh Abu Bakr, uh, Ibn Omar, al Lamtuni. And this is the great uh, Morabi Tun movement. This was in the 12th century, uh, 11th, 12th century in um, North Africa and West Africa. The Morabi Tun was a great movement. Um, their leader uh, 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 at that time was Abu Bakr ibn Umar al Lamtuni. And um, he uh, made his capital Marrakesh in Morocco. It was the Morabi Tun who made Marrakesh as their capital. And Sheikh Abu Bakr, he heard that there were people down by the Niger River, which is more Senegal and those areas, who were entering into Islam and people interested in Islam. So he said, I will give up my position and I will do dawah. So he chose another person, Yusuf ibn uh, Tashfin, rahimahullah. And Yusuf ibn Tashfin, and that is, his grave is there in Marrakesh now, he was a great leader. Abu Bakr went south, and then they started to give dawah, and they went right across West Africa to Central Africa. Hundreds and thousands of people embraced Islam on his hands. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, taking the leadership, unites the Morabi Tun, and they take over what is now Mauritania, Mali, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, the whole of the desert, Algeria. They control the whole desert. They went across into Al-Andalus, you know, at the request of the Spanish Muslims, and they defeated the Christian forces. So they controlled all the way from Spain and Portugal, North Africa, down into West Africa. Huge Islamic empire. Okay? And Yusuf ibn Tashfin, uh, at his height, he had 100,000 horsemen that he could call at any moment. 100,000 horses. Now, in the 11th century, that's serious there, man. That is serious. Okay? Abu Bakr ibn Umar al-Lamtuni, rahimahullah, he returned from the south. Now, one leader, another leader. Okay? And he saw Yusuf ibn Tashveen. What did he do? He said, I give over my leadership permanently to you because you're more qualified than me. <coughs> See that? Many people, they say, well, I'm supposed to be the leader. And then they start fighting each other and there's two movements, right? He said, no, you're more qualified than me. Take it permanently. I will spend the rest of my life in dawah. And he went back to the, to the south and he gave dawah for the rest of his life. See, that's amana. That's amana. And that is the quality that we are in so much need of uh, today, inshallah. So we're going to take a break, inshallah, for the Salat al-Maghrib, and we'll be back, inshallah, with Billahi Tawfiq. Abu Bakr ibn Umar. Abu Bakr ibn Umar al-Lamtuni. Al-Murabitun is the name of the group.
Mm-hmm. <coughs> it's all over the Quran. All over it. <coughs> Sound is okay? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah, wa Sato Sama, Rasulullah, wa Ba'd. As we continue in our understanding of the Islamic revival, um, we're dealing with the outward expression of the revival. And again, this is a balanced way of dealing with um, Islamic understanding, etiquettes, character, way of life in a new environment. And what, what has happened in many cases um, to Muslims, especially in this part of the last part of the 20th century, early part of the 21st, is that uh, Muslims have become very defensive, uh, especially after September 11th. And so <clears throat> you will find that once this Islamophobia came and these attacks on the Muslim world came and individuals, people have a tendency to relate in different ways. Some people, when they, um, when they get, get under attack like this, um, they wanted to assimilate which means that they wanted to be, they figured if they can be the same as their oppressor, <clears throat> if they look like him, act like him, then maybe he'll, for, he'll forget who they are. So they put on his clothes and they acted like them and you know, whatever. But that didn't work. That doesn't work. Because now they are studying us and, and, and the enemies of Islam, uh, of Islam <clears throat> are so afraid that uh, there's no hiding. And I remember once um, <clears throat> the story of a British Muslim. He wanted to get a job in a company. So he went to the company and he put on his blue blazer and gray pants and red tie. Right? He was a proper British you know, uh, business person. And he went in. And so the British man, British, British are very cunning people. They've studied the Muslims. They know us very well, right? So the British man looked at him and said, um, OK, uh, what's your name? And he said, um, my name is Muhammad, but you can call me Mo. Just call me Mo. So the British man said, OK, Mo, um, is there anything special that you would want in our corporation? Is there any needs that you have or anything? And he said, no, 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 no. I'll just fiddle with everybody. I'll be like everybody else. The British man said, OK, um, during the day, do you, do you want to pray? Do you think you might want? He said, no. Mo said, no, not me. You don't have to worry. I'll be a good uh, worker. I, won't, I don't need Salat. Then the British man said, OK, what about Friday? Uh, do you have any activities on Friday? And Mo said, no. I'll be completely with you on Friday. So the British man came back and he said, OK, come back tomorrow. The next day, the British man said uh, to Mo, I'm not giving you the job. Because if you will be dishonest to your religion, you'll be dishonest to me. Think about this now, how deep that is, right? If you'll be dishonest to your religion, because I know that you have to pray. I know that you have your Friday prayers. If you're going to be dishonest to your religion, how can I trust you? So I'm not going to get you a job. So Mo lost in this life and in the hereafter. He's a loser in two worlds. right? So you can't assimilate. There's no full assimilations. Other Muslims, they um, isolate. So they hide in their masjids. They hide in their little communities. And they think that if they're isolated, they won't be touched by Islamophobia. But that's not the reality. Because evil is real. It's real. And we have to face it. So isolation is not going to work. Some people tried desperate confrontation, desperately confronting, doing acts of insanity. But that doesn't work because not Islamic anyway. It's an extreme. So what we need is a balanced uh, approach where we are able to 
uh, become part of the society, but we're not controlled by the society, right? Not one extreme or another. One extreme, they lose their Islam and they say, no, we're pacifists and we don't believe in violence, no, whatever. The other side, they go to extremes and in violence, violence and they try to do as much violence and as evil and despicable as their enemies do. That's another extreme. The reality is, is that Islam is not a religion of, of peace or violence. Is Islam leads you to a state of peace. It, it is a religion for all affairs. In other words, it's a religion when you're in peaceful times. It's a religion in violent times, right? And ultimately, it leads you towards uh, a state of peace, right? But to say that we're pacifists like Mahatma Gandhi, right? This is not right. They say Martin Luther King. This is not right. Although Martin Luther King at the end of his life was actually against the war in Vietnam, he was very much close to Malcolm X just before he was assassinated. Okay? So Islam, we have to be able to express ourselves, you know, and at the same time not go overboard. Okay? So this tradition, um, and especially now in the light of what has happened in New Zealand, where Muslims are gunned down uh, in the masjid, it's important uh, for us to understand how we're going to relate when evil is coming at us. Okay? So Abu Hurairah reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, he, he was talking about the Messenger of Allah, and he said, Ja'a rajulun ila Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqala ya Rasulullah, Ara'ayta in ja a rajalan yuridu akhthamali, kala fa la tu'ati, la tu'ati hu malik. So the person said, O Messenger Allah, what is your opinion if a person who uh, approaches me with the intent of stealing my possessions? So this is evil now coming at you, right? He's a thief, pulls out a gun, whatever. The Prophet said, Do not surrender your possessions to him. Okay? Just take a stand. Kala ara'ayta in qatalani, kala qatilhu. Kala ara'ayta in qatalani, kala fa'anta shaheed, kala ara'ayta in qataltuhu, kala fa'huwa fin nar. So, um, the man then asks to the Prophet, sallam, what if he fights me? Okay, so here's the scenario. The man wants to take your possessions. He said, don't give it to him. What if he fights me? Then the prophet said, then fight him. Then the man said, what if he kills me? The prophet said, you will be shaheed. You're a mara. The man continued, what if I kill him? The prophet said, he will be in the fire. So this is a serious answer. And we do not prescribe to this thing militant Islam, Islamist Islam. No, Islam is for all situations, right? And we have the right of self-defense. We have the right. That if somebody comes into our masjids with weapons to kill our people, we have the right to defend ourselves. It is a God-given right. It is a right in the United Nations. It is a right in any uh, civilized society or uncivilized whatever. You have the right to defend yourself. Okay? And when people go so backwards, bending over backwards because they're so afraid of the world, that's not the Islamic position. It's not. Even if they're going to label us, this is the right to self-defense. And these are the words of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, that you hold your ground. Hold your ground. Do not submit. And there are Muslims, um, the example, one example uh, of Imam Siraj Wahaj, in, who was in Br Brooklyn, New York, and there's a section of Brooklyn, New York, where they, the masjid was. And it turned out that with the breakdown in society, this section of New York became one of the most dangerous places in the city, right on the corner near the masjid, to the point where sisters would come there during the day, and sometimes brothers during the day, and they would be robbed at gunpoint, 12 o'clock noon. Imagine somebody robbing you at 12 o'clock to get your money. 
That's how dangerous this area was. And it was right on the corner near the masjid. And across the masjid, there were these abandoned uh, houses close to the masjid, these abandoned settlements. And this is where the drug dealers and these people. Imam Siraj and the Shura of New York gathered together. And they said, we have to take a stand. So they took a stand, and they got uh, brothers together who are ready to, to defend themselves. And they went over to the drug dealer's area across the street. They went over there. The drug dealers were out selling their drugs, right? And they, they locked, they, they you know, messed their places up, locked it, whatever, and they stood. When the drug dealers came back and they saw the Muslims lined up, the drug dealers said, these people, they want to die. We can't, uh, we can't fight these people. The drug dealers had Uzis and automatic weapons. The Muslims you know, said, no, you're finished in this area. Leave. Drug dealers want to live because they have money, right? They want to enjoy the dunya. So they said, no, these people want to die. Right? So we got their stuff, and they left. And, and Siraj Wahaj's corner became the safest place in New York. And the mayor of New York called him in, the mayor of New York. And they had a big press conference with communities and whatever. And one of the community members said, what is it that you people have? Why? And he said, very simple, it's just a sentence. They said, what is it? He said, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That's what it is that, that is driving us, right? And that was dawah. Many people embraced Islam and whatever, you know, seeing this. And other communities modeled themselves in a community self-defense mode. You see? You're not looking for trouble, but you're defending your land. You're defending your people. You're defending your families. And this is what this hadith uh, is saying. This is um, the proof for anybody who says Islam is you know, a uh, pacifist religion. You know, we don't know. Right? We believe in peace. Right? We are living for peace, but when evil comes to us, we will change it if we, with our hands if we can. That's the difference between us and other ways of life. And the so-called Hindu pacifists and Buddhist pacifists, you see what's happening in India right now, where they slaughter Muslims just because they eat beef. Right? Or the Buddhists who went crazy in Mainama, in Burma, you know, that's supposed to be so-called. This is human nature. So Islam is dealing with human nature. Okay? So we're not pacifists. We're not violent. Islam helps us to regulate ourselves in all situations. See the difference in those answers? It's not one and it's not another extreme. And the other important uh, tradition, um, which comes, it's, it's very similar. And, and, and this one is an important one, especially for youth. And I remember... Um, being in, um, in Cape Town. And, and Cape Town, um, uh, in 2003, Cape Town, the, the, what they call the Cape Flats, it was considered to be the second most dangerous place on Earth in a peaceful situation, except for Bogota, Colombia. They said the most dangerous place on Earth. I'm not talking about war. It's outside of war. But the most dangerous place was Bogota, Colombia, where the Medellin, where the, where the drug cartels were fighting, right? Second, number two, was a place called Manenberg in, on the Cape Flats. And our community was right next to Manenberg, OK? Right next to it, one time. But our community, we had self-defense group. We gave from the Beit al -Mal, and they were prepared to defend the community. Anybody strange who came into our community, they would you know, uh, ask who it is, make sure if it's a dangerous person, get out. No drug dealers allowed. One day I came from the masjid, I was going in my house. And you know the fireworks? At the end of the fireworks, they go boom, 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 boom. They do a whole lot of them in a row. It sounded like that. And then I asked, what is this? And the brother said, no, these are two gangs fighting each other, man. Those are automatic weapons you're hearing, right? And it's right to like two blocks, like I can almost see the things. But they would not dare to come in Surrey Estate. Not once did we have a problem. And I lived there for about six years, 
no problems inside of Surya state because we you know, understood how to deal. And one of the times when I was walking through Surya state, something I saw I didn't like, there was a lot of teenagers sitting in, around, just sitting there on the corner. Okay? And I said, you know, this, this is not right. But, you know, but sometimes people have to gather on corners. In some parts of the Muslim world, when I was in Morocco, I don't know how it is now, uh, but when I was in Morocco, the, the coffee shops, <coughs> they would sit in the coffee shop during the day. And you see a lot of young men sitting around drinking tea and coffee in a coffee shop. Okay, something's wrong. Why are they not busy doing something? When you're idle like that, that's where the shaitan comes in. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiallahu anh, he reports that the Messenger of Allah sallam, said, Iyakum wal julus fit turuqat, faqalu ya Rasulullah, wa ma lana min majalis in abud, natahaddathu fiha. So the Prophet said, beware of sitting on roadsides. The people said, O Messenger of Allah, we have no choice but to attend our sittings, for we discuss affairs in them. That sounds like the coffee shop, right? Many people are drinking tea, you know, who's next president? Hey, uh, there was a right, they're talking politics, right? But this is now on a street corner, okay? So then the Prophet told him, so um, the Prophet then replied. And you know, he said that because uh, they said we have to we have to talk. We have to be on the street corners. And urban settlements now. Urban life has created these street corner people hanging around. Okay? So the Prophet replied, if you refuse to do other than gather, okay, then give the road its rights. Okay, you want to hang on the corner now? Hanging on the corner, right? Give the road its rights. They said, what is the right of the road? He said, lower the gaze. Restrain from harming anyone. Return salams and call to righteousness and forbid evil. This is a very interesting hadith. Now this one is, and I've run directly into situations with youth, right? Hanging out in the mall, hanging out on the street corner, right? Watching the young guys, watching all the girls go by, right? What are they doing? What do the prophets say? If you're going to hang out, lower the gaze. So you can't be uh, looking at the women. You got to lower your gaze. You want to be out there? Okay, you can be out there. Lower your gaze, right? And don't harm anybody. Okay? And if somebody goes by and gives you salams, you got to return it. So you're actually spreading salams, right? And then you call to the good and you forbid evil. So what this what happens out of this, it's almost like a, a, a community police force that's on the corner. It turns from being a place where drugs could be sold, where wrong could be done, and where the youth become like a community police force. And this is very important you know, in community affairs um, when we're dealing with the youth. And uh, uh, you know, it is the right of the road. And there are many roads like this in Muslim countries here in this part of the world. And Muslims find themselves in that situation. But what happens? In many cases, there's a television. They're walking, watching the soccer game, right? Or something else, right? They're on their cell phones. You know, this is where drugs are sold. This is where many things can happen, OK? So Muslims, if you're going to do this, then you become the, minister, the, the local police force for the community. And in this way, it would actually cut down in a community, drug dealing, prostitution, robbery, right, abuse. That would be cut down all over the communities. If the people who are on the roads 
would actually follow the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So this is a serious part of the sunnah. Some people think sunnah is two rakat sunnah. Yes, it is two rakat sunnah. That's sunnah too. There's a sunnah for every situation. And part of the revival now, and I say this is something that you will not find in the 40 hadith books of many of the scholars because they didn't face something like this. They did not necessarily face on the level that we did. But this is tailor-made for the urbanization of the world that is going on and how Muslims find themselves uh, in an urban situation. Okay? So I want to open up the floor uh, for any uh, discussion anybody has you know, about this. It is the right of self-defense uh, and also uh, the right of the road. That if people are on the road, how do they function? You know, what is permissible uh, for them? Floor is open for any discussion anybody has. Um, no. I think there was, after what happened in New Zealand, there was a question asked to a uh, police officer. Yeah. You know, so for in these situations, mm. can we keep something, say, in the office or right. you know, anywhere mm -hmm. uh, to defend ourselves? They said, no. That will be the intent to right. someone, so you cannot keep any kind of, I know, Weapons, weapons, firearms, right? Not even, not even firearms, even, you know, baseball bats and stuff like that with the intent of harming someone. Right. Okay, New Zealand is um, a unique place. This is why it's so strange that this happened in New Zealand. It's, it's considered to be the second safest place in the world. Uh, so they have eliminated a lot of violence, you know, in their society, right? Um, and it will vary from place to place. If you're in Australia, it's a different situation, right? Because Australians are like outback cowboys. If you're in America, right, it's a common, you can buy weapons in Walmart. You know, so I mean, it's a different situation, right? And, you know, this is where, um, you know, you, it, it's tailor made to the situation. In this case, what um, would be prescribed or possibly prescribed, is a um, type of security guards. So the security guards, even in Toronto, you see them with the uniforms on, they don't carry weapons, right? But the security guard is trained or should be trained to disarm somebody. These ones here are useless. But you, know, you can train a security guard, you know, and there's a type of martial arts training where you are trained to disarm somebody. They're pointing a weapon, and you know how to move and disarm them from the weapon, right? You can be trained like that. And at the same time, they have a, a connection with the police force. So the local masjid is then connected to the police force. And this is what we're thinking about here in Canada as well, because Canada also does not encourage firearms. And to get a license for firearms is really rigorous you know, type of thing, and you know, but what we can do is that we can have a security force, you know, people, and actually we should have somebody who is securing the masjid while we pray. Because people think, um, no, it's Salat, brother, they just call the Iqama. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when they were in a dangerous situation, they had Salat al-Khawf. And Salat al-Khawf is where one group prays, the other group guards, and then they switch. Right? So even though the Iqamah is made, a group of the believers have their weapons and they protect uh, the camp. Okay? And then they switch and the other ones take their weapon and they protect the camp. So what is done in this case is that you have a security guards, especially in Juma, there should be people you know, uh, around the area on the Jumas who patrol the masjid, who are standing there, right? who, who have the ability to disarm an active shooter, or immediately call the police, and they will secure the building, right, to protect the believers, and the police will come. And if the police are informed, like here in, in, in Toronto, they're moving around in cars and bikes. They can be here within five to 10 minutes, they can be here. So the security guard has just got to secure the place, okay, till the people come with the firearms. So that, that would be the solution, you know, in uh, situations like, in the United States is different. Uh, in, in some cases, like in Texas and in Florida, um, CARE Florida, for instance, the head of CARE Florida, 
actually is encouraging Muslims to take firearm instructions and that there should be somebody, you know, either a police officer or a local person who has a firearm, Juma, they should be there, standing. Because the threat that's in Florida and Texas, Florida, Texas, Arizona, are probably the worst uh, states in terms of gun violence and Islamophobia direct like this, right, to attack you. You know, so it, 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 it will vary according to the place uh, it is. But the idea is self-defense, to start thinking in terms of self-defense, right? And we're not sheep to be taken to the slaughter. This is not what we are, okay? Floor is open for any other general questions uh, anybody has. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and this is really bad because even in a place called Plainfield, New Jersey, <clears throat> it was um, Muslims moved in and they were actually a good um, element in the community. Their presence actually lowered um, drug dealing and you know what not. And the general community in Plainfield, they were glad. But then they introduced shisha. And when they introduced the shisha shops, they would now sit smoking shisha. After a while, well, even some of the sisters in hijab are smoking shisha. And that's one of the worst sights to see. A, a sister in hijab doing the bubbly, you know, and smoking the shisha. This is wrong. It's just wrong. And because of people hanging out smoking shisha, drug dealers started to come. Because when you get tired, you know, of the fruit, they put in a little hashish or something else. So now that area of Plainfield became uh, a dangerous area. And it's actually you know, advised now to close those shops down. See? So again, if, if these uh, Muslims in Cairo knew this, right, they wouldn't be harming people with their smoke. Right? They would be given salams. They'd have a different intention to be there instead of just wasting their time like he's a sultan you know, smoking his, his, his shisha in his harem. No, this is the wrong concept. Any other um, uh, questions anybody has? So this is the right of the road. So yeah. We are supposed to cover three of the personalities as in the last three years? So. Yeah, so um, we will be, we're going to see how it goes. Um, because of the importance of these three people in their teachings, um, we may at this point finish the book and then Next semester, we will then do the personalities, right? And what, what I'll do at the end is just give like a little summary of the personalities, so at least we get that. But because of the depth of their teachings, they need a lot of time, each one, to understand. So we'll connect this to the next semester and try to revitalize it and make it more interesting for other people. But we'll, we'll put them in, inshallah, the next time. So next week, inshallah, there will be no class. Next week, I'll be away in Spain, uh, inshallah, on the trip. And then the following week, we'll be back, inshallah. And the last three, we're going to go right up to the end of the month. Even some of the other, other classes might stop. We're going to continue right to the end of uh, April. So we can, so we can continue uh, the book. Fin yeah, so we want to finish the book, inshallah. Um, but it'll still be a week before uh, Ramadan begins. Okay? Yeah. So, um, so we'll see you next uh, We see the following week. Next week, there's no class. Following week, inshallah, have a safe journey home. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.